for the induction ceremony to the International Sports Hall of Fame. Please welcome our inductees. This is a very exciting afternoon for all of us, including the inductees, but I'd like to take this opportunity to introduce you to the president of the Olympia Weekend, who will give you our welcoming address. Please welcome Mr. Dan Solomon, president of the Olympia Weekend. You'll have to forgive me the absurdity of me welcoming, delivering a welcome mess message and kicking off an event as I stand on the same stage as the legendary Bruce Buffer. It seems a little absurd. And I almost feel like I want to step back and let you take it from here. But with that said, uh, as we welcome you to the International Sports Hall of Fame 2024 induction, I would like to first and foremost welcome you to the 60th edition of Joe Weider's Olympia Fitness and Performance Weekend. It's, um, this event is uh, it's really such a unique thing because so much of what we do around the Olympia is geared towards bringing the world of fitness and muscle and sports nutrition and all the things that we all support each and every day together for a weekend and celebrate our, our passion and our love for all of that. But one of the real gratifying parts about what I get to do is watching the way the sport, the fitness movement, has connected different parts of the world over the years. Um, Hollywood has connected with us, um, other major sports from Major League Baseball to the NBA to the UFC to other sports and disciplines have come together to rally behind what we're doing on the fitness side. There was, there was a time when bodybuilding had become so niche that it was almost taboo, right? There was four or five guys in every community that walked around with jugs of water and lived that lifestyle, and now we've watched it evolve. I was talking last night to our seven-time Mr. Olympia, Phil Heath, and we were talking about this very topic where, you know, it's gotten to a point where our champions, guys like Phil and other great champions like Jay Cutler, who's with us today, um, they are, they're, they're traveling the world and they're speaking and they're delivering messages about hard work and dedication and devotion, which is why this International Sports Hall of Fame is so important to us here at the Olympia and we're so proud to welcome it as a part of our program because it is really the embodiment of all of that. It is bringing together all corners of the physical and sports culture. And as you look at this panel, it represents many different parts of, of our lives, past, present, and future. And um, it's actually pretty humbling to stand here on this stage and, and be a part of a ceremony that is recognizing individuals from all walks of life who have achieved iconic, illustrious, legendary status. Uh, Dr. Goldman has done an incredible job of creating this International Sports Hall of Fame, bringing it to the world, um, celebrating um, incredible athletes from Evander Holyfield to Johnny Bench and everyone in between. It is a sparkling, impressive group, and I hope it's not lost on anyone up here what it means to be a part of this Hall of Fame. And um, I know that Fairfax Hackley, there, is, there are a few people who are as devoted to any one thing the way Fairfax Hackley is devoted to this International Sports Hall of Fame. So give it up to uh, Fairfax Hackley. Of course. And um, with that, I, I would just like to um, point out one thing that I think is a glaring thing and everybody's thinking it, nobody wants to say it. But as I look at this panel, and it's, it's really wild, this, uh, I mean, my, it's, it's, our, it's our childhood, it's everything, right? It's all up here. And um, you have a panel that includes an I iconic movie director and um, the strongest human who's ever lived and a seven-time Olympia champion and 
a quarterback who was winning Super Bowls when I was a, a child, and, and, um, and of course one of the most legendary um, voices um, of our time are all up here on this panel. But I hope it's not lost on any of you that there is only one female on this panel and she would kick all of your asses. Yeah. So with that, it is my great privilege to welcome you to the induction ceremony of the International Sports Hall of Fame. Thank you. I can't help myself right now. I'm so excited. Aren't you? Well, paraphrasing someone that I know quite well up here, it's here! <laughs> the moment you've all been waiting for, the 13th Annual International Sports Hall of Fame Induction Ceremony Class of 2024. But before we begin, let me introduce you to the man standing off stage to my right. He is a medical doctor, a grand master of the martial arts, an author, a Guinness's world record holder. He was voted one of the top philanthropists in the world. He is the co-founder and president of the A4M. He is knighted. He is a monk. He just came off his fast because he's Jewish. Go figure. <laughs> and besides that, he is one of my very best friends. Please give it up for Dr. Robert Goldman. Sorry, bro, you're not getting that job at the UFC. It's already taken. It's great to see everybody here. I really appreciate people coming out for this once a year event. We really try to make this very special. Uh, we work all year, and Fairfax and the advisors work all year for this one hour, this one very special hour. And the reason that I started the International Sports Hall of Fame was to honor great legends, great athletes, great legends, but not only for the inspiration that they have given to the generations of kids who have watched them, but also what they've done post-career and their charitable works, the giving back, that is as important as what they have done as athletes. So we try to look at it as a whole. We also try to mix the group. So we have a very diverse group of people, all legends in their particular sports, yet so unique and so different in their own way. Now, the International Sports Hall of Fame is a nonprofit, but I fund it personally because I feel we don't want any commercial outlet. We don't want any Nike banners or Gatorade or any of that. This is all about you guys tonight, about nobody else but just about you. We try to keep this as pure as we can so that you are honored in the purest fashion for all the great things that you have done in your life. And you're also enshrined in the University of Texas Austin at the Stark Center, which is the largest physical culture museum in the world, and all the posters and medals and artifacts from these events is enshrined for history. So it's not just a one-time event, it actually goes into a museum in, in perpetuity. I want everybody here to understand, this is really like a once-in-a-lifetime experience. All of us here in this room, it's doubtful we'll all ever be together again in one room, you know, because things happen. And I'll give you an example. I'll give you an example of that. A number of years ago, we were inducting Bruno San Martino and Franco Colombo. Franco Colombo, of course, is a Mr. Olympia. Bruno San Martino, Arnold Schwarzenegger, and Franco Colombo had not seen each other in 48 years till I put them all on this stage together. They were working out in a gym together 48 years prior. Imagine two of the greatest bodybuilders in history, one of the greatest wrestlers in history, all legends had not seen each other until that human dynamic of the four of them on that, on the three of them on that stage together. And that's what makes it all really unique. So I want you to understand, you are now witnessing part of history. This is not just another event. 
this is a truly historical event. Also in the audience, we have some of our past inductees, and I just wanted to introduce with my lousy eyesight, Michael Jai White, stand up, Michael. Eight, eight black belts, movie star, phenomenal, his lovely Lice Gillian. Cynthia Rothrock just had her movie premiere the other day. Over 70 movies, the number one lady out there for martial arts. Don the Dragon Wilson, 11 time world kickboxing champion, undefeated. Behind her, Linda Murray, one of the greatest Miss Olympias in history. Ed Cohen, probably the greatest power lifter in history, 70 world records. I hope I'm not missing any other, uh, it's hard for me to see with these bright lights, and I'm not missing anybody else. So again, and I'd like to thank the advisors. I see Rick Collins in here. We have some of their advisors. Most importantly, this could not happen without Fairfax. You know, this is an enormous amount of work all year and years to put this class together. I think almost took almost three years. But this could never happen without the hard work of Fairfax. So let's give it up for him. He really puts a tremendous amount of work and effort into it. Now, I wanted to show you some of the things that you guys are going to have to carry home with you. So every inductee will be receiving this gold medallion. Now, I'll give you a little history. This medallion, I held an art contest between 350 artists to come up with this design. And these are all hand-casted, coated in gold. They'll get that. In addition to that, we like you guys to stay well-dressed. So. We have these custom-made jackets with the logo on them as well. And we made it military because we know you guys are all badasses. So, uh, so we made this out of in a military mode and we all gave you high degree black belts too. Also, I feel like I'm at a, a, you know, a haberdashery show. We also have your own hats with the logo embraced in the hat to each of you. And for your desk, we have gold medallion. We also have cufflinks. This, your custom-made, handmade badge as an inductee of the year that you were on. Now, I get the pleasure of not only introducing people who are my good friends, but also like my brothers. First inductee, J.J. Perry. J.J. is an American movie actor, director, martial arts stuntman. He is probably the best in all of Hollywood. He is the go-to guy. He began practicing martial arts in 1975 at the age of eight years old. And he came from a rough upbringing and he pulled himself up and he became one of the hottest dire directors and stunt guys in Hollywood. He then went into the military as a teenager in 1980. He earned his fourth Don Black Belt in, in Taekwondo in 1993. Then he began his, his acting career and his martial arts career. He's been in movies such as Mortal Kombat, Buffy the Vampire Slayer, Scorpion King, 24, Beowulf the Town, all these action movies that he's been in. He also shared the Male Stuntman of the Year Award at the 2004 World Stunt Awards for his work. In 2012, he was the Stunt Coordinator of the Year at the Action Fest Action Movie Festival. He's also been awarded Icon Award and the Legendary Stunt Award for his work. And now he's moved from a stuntman to a director, but this guy has been the stunt guy for every major franchise you can imagine. This is a man who put together the stunts for the Expendables, all the John Wicks. I got to see it as 8711 Jim. He showed me the stunts from John Wick three years before the first John Wick, and I could not believe the stunts that I was seeing, unbelievable. So this guy comes up just not with stunts, amazingly new stunts, all the Fast and Furious, JJ. He's worked with all the A-listers, Schwarzenegger, Stallone, Keanu Reeves, The Rock, Dwayne Johnson. In fact, The Rock says that this, he's the man. He's the one I work with with all movies. Jason Staten, Jet Li, you name it, this guy has worked with them. But his rule is, if for his stunt workers, the rule is, if you're afraid to die today, don't come into work. He's also the co-founder of the 8711 Gym, which is where he demonstrated the John Wick stunts, and he directed, he directed Day Shift, which was a big, big hit on Netflix, and just a few weeks ago, I was at his movie premiere for Killer's Game that was in theaters all around the world. Let's give it up for J.J. Perry.
guys are strong so they can handle the eight pound lift. Fairfax, to be uh, even mentioned with the 2024 class is even in the same breath as these people is super humbling for me. Um, my love affair with sport and martial arts started in 1975, and um, it taught me all the things I needed to know in life. My, my father left for Vietnam before I was born, so my master kind of took that role. But um, the lessons that I learned were hard work and reward, and. The, the best lessons in life used to come from when you lost, but that's where you learn the most. Um, joined the Army in 1986 on the Elite Athlete Program for Taekwondo. Got to travel all over Korea and all over the world. Got to fight in Korea, Thailand, Japan. But it gave me this mindset when I got out of the Army, I moved down to LA and got into the stunt work. And um, you know, usually the stunt performers are the people that stay behind the curtain. Uh, we don't step out and get awards. We usually don't say we, we don't say we did that or we did this. We stay in the shadows. So for me to get this is a, it's a little awkward and it makes me a little nervous, but I'm super grateful for it. Um, it's been a wild ride for me when I got out of the Army and got into the stunt business. I thought for sure I'd mess that up and I'd be back in the Army in no time. And somehow I fumbled my way here. But uh, being a stunt man to being a fight coordinator to being a second unit director to becoming into the directing business and uh, just evolving with that all has been such a great journey for me. And I have to thank everyone that helped me along the way. And I, I don't think we have enough time for me to name all those names, but uh, I'm super grateful for this. And um, thank you again, Dr. Bob and Fairfax and everyone. Thank you. Next, Brian Shaw. American retired professional strongman, widely regarded as one of the greatest strength athletes of all time. He won the 211, 213, 215, and 216 World Strongest Man competition, making him one of only five men to win the World Strongest Man four times. In 211, Shaw became the first man to win the Arnold Classic Strongman competition, as well as the World Strongman competitions in the same calendar year a feat he replicated in 215. With 27 international competition wins, he is the fourth most decorated strongman in history. He has also set more than 25 world records in deadlifting, stone lifting, keg tossing, grip related movements, and more. At a tiny six foot eight, 454 pounds, he is truly one of the strongest men to ever live. Brian Shaw. First, I want to say thank you to uh, Fairfax, Dr. Goldman, the entire committee for selecting me. I mean, this is a, uh, definitely a big honor uh, to be up here, and, and especially with this class, you know, it's phenomenal, phenomenal. And, um, you know, for me, I think, you know, I started as a small town kid, right? Just a kid, and, and my parents were, were great. They were super supportive and allowed me to dream. And I had the ability to dream big and to believe in myself, right? So as, as my path started, you know, I, I went down the basketball path. That was my goal, my dream. I wanted to play in college, and that was what I wrote down. I wrote down my goal when I was 10 years old. I'm going to earn a college basketball scholarship, put in the hard work, did everything I needed to do, and I was able to do that. Once I was done playing basketball, I needed another competitive outlet because I am unbelievably competitive right so i love lifting and i thought hey these guys on tv that i've seen you know lifting these crazy things i think i could do that so you know i started to compare my size my stats all of that to these guys and and uh did some research figured out how i could find a contest i entered it i was hooked immediately and then went down the strongman path 
set new goals and uh, you know climb the ranks pretty quickly within the strongman sport up to the point that I, I actually tied at World Strongest Man. First and only tie in, in the history of the sport. They didn't even know what to do. It wasn't in the rules, right? That was in South Africa. I unfortunately lost on a count back, which, you know, to this day, we can debate that, but lost on a count back, 16 hour plane ride back, didn't sleep a wink. And I said, what am I trying to do? What am I trying to do with my life? What am I trying to do with strong man? What am I trying to do with everything? And two words popped into my head, be great right be great that's what i was trying to do with all of it so i got back to my gym which was a uh, a grocery store that had gone out of business it was just their their storeroom found a piece of wood and wrote be great on it set it up on the wall and looked at that every single day and that's been in my gym since that day and that is what i have strived for with everything so of course you know you've got the accomplishments within the sport of strongman you know i, I was very competitive, very driven, very motivated to do everything I did. And, uh, you know, I always wanted to get into a position like this to be in the conversation of the strongest men that have ever walked on this planet. And I think that I have been able to do that. Obviously, you know, just being in that conversation is wonderful because, again, I started as a small town kid, right? And, and the, the thought process was, the world's strongest man, the strongest man on this planet has to come from somewhere, right? So I believed in myself. I had a lot of good people along my path help me out, be in my corner, you know, and again, that, that list is, is very long and I'm, I'm so thankful and grateful for everybody that helped me out along the way because without all of those people in my corner, I couldn't have done it by myself. Of course, I have to walk out there and perform, but there, there's a team and there always has been a team around me you know, that started with my parents early on and moved on to my wife being there for me, my boys, you know, a, a, lot, of, a lot of motivation that you can draw from the people around you, the, the support group that you have. And, uh, you know, the path has been incredible and, and um, you know, I'm so thankful for that. But one of the things was strong, man, I wanted to leave the sport in a better spot than when I started. And I have been very vocal about this uh, I wanted to see changes made within the sport and I knew at a certain point after about a decade of trying that I needed to take things into my own hands and if, if, if you're going to do something, oftentimes you have to step up and do it yourself. So we started the Shaw Classic and we have ran that the last five years. We now crown the strongest man on earth and I'm very, very proud of the work that we have done, my wife, my team. Uh, it's been an incredible ride, but uh, you know, it looks like this year we're actually going to give out the largest prize money potentially in the sport of strongman, um, which you know, the, we're just getting started. We're just scratching the surface, and, and um, you know, it's my way of giving back to the sport, to the guys, to the fans, uh, to everybody, and, and uh, there's a lot more to come. I mean, I feel like this is you know, kind of just putting the cherry on, on top of chapter one. Uh, I still have a lot of goals and dreams and things to go after and um, you know, an impact, but you know, my message to a lot of people has just been that to be great, right? You can wake up every single day. I feel like every person is born with some gift, some ability. And all you have to do is find that, you know, God blessed me certainly with my size and my strength. And I had to work incredibly hard to maximize that. But I found my passion. I worked hard to maximize it. And I, I feel like every single person out there can do that because you know, truth be told, I'm just a normal guy. I'm a small town kid. Um, now I'm a, a husband and a father. And, and um, you know, I, I just get up and try to do something each and every day to get better. So, you know, if, if you take that away, if everybody takes that away, you can spread a lot of positivity and the world absolutely can be a better place. And I appreciate all of you guys for being here. Thank you. Good job. Thank you. Good job. I gotta move the mic down now to the little people. <laughs> you should also know that Brian, the Shaw Championship he put together, even though he won it both years, he gave the prize money out to all the other athletes. And that's the charitable work that shows the kind of guy he is. <laughs> now for the most beautiful panelist and inductee. You know, Misha looks more like a supermodel than 
a girl who could beat up everybody in the room. Uh, first time I saw her fight, I go, what is, before she was going to fight, I said, why does somebody look so pretty getting in the ring with these animals? And she is a remarkable, remarkable athlete. American professional mixed martial artist. She currently competes in the women's bantam division of the UFC, of which she is a former women's UFC world champion. She was formerly the Strike Force world, cha world champion, the bantam weight, and she also captured the 135 pound championship of bantam weight in the freestyle cage fighting as well. She defeated Holly Holm via technical submission due to a rear neck choke in the fifth round to become the new UFC Bantam champion. She has also won numerous other fights and won three Performance of the Night awards. A remarkable, remarkable female athlete, tough as nails, bright, articulate. She's got the whole package. Let's give it up for Misha Payton. really heavy. Might not be heavy. You made it look easy, but no surprise. Um, it is really my pleasure and honor to be inducted tonight with such an amazing panel of people. I want to start with my thank yous. Um, first, I would like to thank Dr. Bob and, and Hack Fairfax. Thank you so much, especially he had to really track me down. I'm not an easy person to get a hold of, so I know you. Went, I put you through the ringer, but thank you for thinking of me and bringing me here today. I really appreciate it. Um, the International Sports Hall of Fame, I think what you guys do, what you stand for, um, the work that you do in the community is incredible. So I'm really glad to be here in some way representing that. Um, I would also like to thank my parents, especially my mom, for raising me to not take no for an answer and to never segregate myself. Um, I would like to say a huge thank you to my fiance, Johnny over there. See that, that handsome man holding the camera on me? He's a man, he is the framework to everything that I do. And it's so nice to have a supportive partner. Um, as, as many of you know, when you have that person in your life who really stands by you, supports you, pushes you, keeps you on time to things, or at least in my case, that would be something that he does on the regular. Um, and also a great father to our two children, which brings me to the, the next point. I would like to thank my children because um, they have given more to me than any they could ever know. Um, I have a six-year-old daughter named Amaya and a four-year-old son named Daxton, and they're just the most incredible little people on the planet, and they're a huge part of my reason why I do what I do and why I try to keep elevating and being the best version of myself. So now I'm going to tell you a little bit about my backstory and maybe how I, how I got to this position. I started wrestling when I was a freshman in high school. And it wasn't because I set out to wrestle. I never was a big contact sports person. I didn't watch fighting. I didn't have older brothers. I don't have a history of, of anybody wrestling or doing contact sports in my family. So people were like, why would you do that? Well, it really came down to I didn't want to play basketball. That was the honest truth. I didn't want to play basketball, and it was the only women's sport offered during that season, but I wanted to play a sport. So my friend Sharon came up with this brilliant idea. Why don't we go out for the wrestling team? I said, well, they don't have women wrestling on the wrestling team. And she said, yeah, well, I guess it turns out, though, that if they don't have the women there, we can do it on, on the men's team. And I said, well, that's a crazy idea. And I went home. I asked my mom. Thank you, Mom, for not telling me no, because I know I wouldn't be standing here today if I didn't go out for wrestling that very next day. She said to me, well, I'm not going to tell you you can't. If you want to do it, go ahead and do it. She's like, I'm not sure you're going to like it, but let me know how it turns out for you. So I went the next day, and to say that I got annihilated would be an understatement. I got my butt kicked, and it was very clear that the, the guys there, not bad guys, they just shared the sentiment of most people that women did not belong on the mat at that time. Um, so they tried to get me to quit, but it took great pride in the fact that they could not make me quit. And I remember thinking after that first day, even before that first day, you know, what's the worst thing that can happen? You know, and I stuck with it for four years. 
I'll be honest, I didn't win matches against males. You know, I was too late in the game. They were too physically advanced. And I'm not a tiny girl. I was never going to be 103 pounds, you know, maybe. No, that wasn't me. So I thought, what's the worst going to happen? Well, I, I found out. I got, you know, my butt kicked. And I stuck with it. And by the end of four years, I won the coach's award. To, and to date, this is one of my most proud accomplishments because it was given out to a single athlete on the team that kind of embodies what you would want out of a wrestler and a teammate. And I never thought on that first day or even that first season that the entire team would come around to embrace me in a brotherhood as an equal. So for me, that was such an important lesson to learn, to learn as a young woman, as a young girl. Now we'll bring you to my first day of college. Um, I meet my friend, Rosalia, she's in the same dorm as me, and she says, hey, uh, do you want to come to this mixed martial arts club sport that they have here at the college? And I said, no, thank you. And it's so funny how little we know about ourselves sometimes. I really thought that I had no interest in mixed martial arts. I sure did not have any interest in getting hit, nor did I have any interest in hitting anybody else. But she was persistent, and destiny found its way to me once again, and I said, okay, I." I will humor you, I'll go one time. And I showed up, and on my very first day, I learned how to choke people. And as you could guess, I was hooked. And I thought, well, you know, what's the worst thing that could happen? Well, three weeks later, I found myself in my very first fist fight. Gloved up, taped up, and um, I won the first round, I did not win the second round. Lack of preparation. You know, you know that anything that you want to do and do well, you should prepare for. I didn't have that opportunity. I jumped in so quick to the sport that uh, I got put in a Muay Thai clinch. And for those of you that know what that is, um, some pretty nasty knees came flying at my body and my face, one of which broke my nose, lost a lot of blood. Um, and. I was winning again by the end of the second round, but we go into the third round and my coaches say, we're not letting you go back out there. They look like ghosts. Probably had never seen a female take this kind of damage. But I knew in that moment that a fighter had been born. I didn't exactly understand what I was going to go through and showing up in that moment, but I understood afterwards what I needed to do to be more prepared for the next moment. So I went on to win my next six fights, and then I got the call, or I said my coach got the call, hey, um, we're looking for a professional female, so this time I was amateur, professional female fighter to come to Evansville, Indiana, and do this tournament. And I thought, well, what's the worst thing that can happen? We go there. I win the first fight. Second fight, I get knocked out with a head kick. And I'm talking, out, cold, couldn't even remember my first fight. So I found out what the worst thing that could happen. It's the theme of this story. And I go home, I regroup, I revamp. I move on to win the Strike Force women's title. You know, then I lose that title via a very gruesome armbar. And then the UFC calls and says, we want women to come to the UFC. I'm like, of course, you know, what's the worst thing that could happen? Um, I'm making a career out of this at this point. And I continued on. I lost fights, I won fights. I finally got to the point where I had an opportunity to fight Holly Holm, and I win with a fifth round submission. And I guess in that part, in that highlight, in that moment, and as I continued my career forward from there, I found out that when you are not afraid of the worst thing that can happen, you will find out what the best thing is that can happen. And I think that would be my closing note here is just to remember, like, we have to take risk. We have to take chances. We have to accept failure as a part of learning and a part of the journey. And when you do that, you're sure to find out what you're made of. And you're most likely to find out what the greatest things are in life. So thank you again for having me today. I'm so honored to have this reward. And um, now I'll let it move on to the next. Thank you, guys. Our next inductee, Bruce Buffer, it's American Professional Mixed Martial Arts. It's time to begin the main event of the evening. This fight is five rounds for the undisputed title of UFC Light Heavyweight 
champion of the world, the pride of Ireland, and the number three ranked federal fighter in the world, the notorious Conor McGregor. Gentlemen, this is the main event of the evening. Bruce is so good in the octagon, we had to have the sound for you guys. Again, he's an American professional mixed martial arts ring announcer and the official octagon announcer for the UFC, Ultimate Fighting Championship. He's introduced these events all over the world, and he is also known as the veteran voice of the octagon. His catchphrase is, it's time, when he announces before the main event of the USC card. Bruce holds a second degree black belt in Tang Soo Do, so he not only watches it, he knows how to fight as well, and he's also trained as a kickboxer. He began working in the UFC announcer in 1997 and is considered one of the most popular and recognizable figures in the sport. Bruce uses the catch phases in his announcing and also has a signature move known as the buffer 180, which he motions directly across the octagon before quickly spinning 180 degrees and pointing to the corner being introduced. Buffer also performs 45 degree and 90 degree turns before most buffer 180s but reserves the buffer 180 for the main events and co-main events. He also happens to be a half-brother of boxing and professional ring announcer Michael Buffer, who was a past inductee, and they are the first two brothers to ever be inducted into the International Sports Hall of Fame. Let's give it up for Bruce Buffer. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much. I appreciate your being here at this time. I want to thank Fairfax Hackney and Dr. Robert Goldman and all at the International Sports Hall of Fame for this prestigious honor and to share this day with all these fine, fine inductees, which is an honor for me as an individual. My path here was a long path that was unexpected. I'd owned my first business when I was 19, and I owned a variety of businesses. I'm basically an entrepreneur my entire life. And my life drastically took a very dramatic change in the late 1990s when boxing was the water cooler conversation on a Monday the way UFC is today. I was watching every Tuesday night fight, Saturday night, Sunday wide world of sports. And my dad, who was a huge boxing fan, was teaching me boxing basically at four years old on, teaching me fighting techniques. He was a close combat, hand-to-hand uh, -hand combat instructor in the Marines, served in World War II in Korea. I grew up with a drill instructor. I used to walk in the room and say, hi, Dad. And he'd say, son, project your voice, chest out, shoulders back. Let them know you're in the room. So I always stood up with that kind of an attitude all my life. And when I was watching boxing with him and my brother Brian and my beautiful mama one, one day, we were watching. And out came this debonair, handsome-looking man, dressed to the nines in a tuxedo, had a very James Bond image, came up with that phrase, let's get ready to rumble. and. I became a fan of this, of this gentleman. But at the same time, my curiosity was piqued because at the time that he came out, they were Chiron on the screen, Michael Buffer. Now, I own telemarketing companies in my 20s, and I've seen every phone book in the United States. We didn't have the internet back then. And like most of us would do, I looked up my name in the phone book, and I never saw the name Buffer in any phone book in the United States. So my curiosity was piqued. I'm wondering, who is this guy? I thought we kind of looked alike, although he's very, very handsome, very <laughs> much better looking than me, if you want to call it that. And I thought, could, we, could there be some connection here? So I would call up Don King's offices, Bob Arum's offices. I was trying to find out more information about this gentleman. And I found out that he grew up in an area close to where I grew up in Philadelphia. And then my interest became even more piqued. And I started making more phone calls, more phone calls. And eventually, people were stopping me on the street saying, hey, is, are you Michael Buffer's brother? 
the man that says, let's get ready to rumble. And I said, no, my brother's Brian. I have no idea who that is. And this kept going on and on until finally, my dad and I were driving up north one day, I'll never forget it. And I said, dad, this is happening, this is happening. We watch this man on TV. Do you have any idea who this, who this guy is? And I got this. I think that's your brother. I go, what? I'm 28 years old. And I'm like, I think that's her brother. What are you talking about, Dad? He said, son, I never told you. When I was 20 years old, I went in to serve my time during World War II. I went overseas for nine months. I was married before. Uh, when I came back, a son had been born. A divorce ensued. Um, the last time I saw him was when he was two and a half years old. It's just one of these stories with all respect to the situation. And it turned out that um, when Michael was doing an event in L.A., uh, one night, I had my father call the venue and leave a message for him. And Michael called him back, and they got together for lunch. Now, at this time, Michael was 43 years old. It turned out to be his son, Michael Buffer. And very interesting to this story is, is that when my dad, uh, his mother, back when he was two and a half, he had put him up with a, another family to be raised. And as Michael would say, he had a leave it, leave it to beaver lifestyle, and he grew up under the name of Michael Huber. So when he went in the Army at 20 during the Vietnam War, they looked on his birth certificate, which was never formally changed, he was never formally adopted, and they said, you're not Michael Huber, you're Michael Buffer, right? Had that not happened, I wouldn't be standing here today. I owe this because of meeting my brother, because four years later, running the companies that I ran, I had two companies, I was living an amazing uh, lifestyle, beach house, sort of like a two-and-a-half-man lifestyle, minus the alcoholism. Um, and I really enjoyed what I did. I was doing quite well, but I was very burned out on my businesses. And one time I went to Vegas to see him as I used to go and meet up with him and we go to fights together. And I watched the reaction of Jack Nicholson, Hulk Hogan, all the people in the audience when he said, let's get ready to rumble. And I had an epiphany. And I went back to my room that night instead of going out and partying or playing blackjack or whatever we love to do in Vegas. And I incessantly started writing three pages of notes. I couldn't stop. My hand just kept going. Uh, trademark this phrase put them in the basketball cards, football fields, movies, TVs, toys, let's get ready to rumble, video games, all this. And I kept writing and writing and writing and I met up with him and I said, later on, a couple weeks later, I said, Michael, you know, I think you need to do something very strong. We need to trademark this phrase properly. I wanna make you richer and more famous than you ever dreamed. I wanna sell both my companies. I'll quit with the money I have in the bank. I'll become your manager, your business partner, and we'll go for it. And he was very intrigued by the idea, and he said, that sounds incredible, but how are you gonna do all this? I said, I really have no idea. I said, but if I'm gonna give up this to do this, better believe I'll make it happen. And that was basically over 30 years ago. And during this time period, I would put him in every big event that happened, uh, whether it was WCW wrestling at the time, every event taking place, imploding hotels in Vegas, football games, basketball games, you name it. But along came an event in 1993 called the UFC. And when the UFC came along, it was a very big spectacle back then. It wasn't a mainstream sport. And it was an uh, amazing change to all type of fighting. And I knew in my heart this could be the biggest thing in the world if it was refined and, and managed correctly. So in 1996, I called them up and I had Michael do three of the events, UFC 6, 7, and Ultimate Ultimate. But during our first time when we were in uh, Cass, Wyoming, when he announced his first event, the owner, Robert Meyerowitz, said to him, listen, when you get in the octagon, I want you to say, if it's not in the octagon, it's not real. Well, at that time, wrestling, with all respect to wrestling, because I have huge respect for wrestlers, but it's sports entertainment. They do get hurt. I have tremendous respect for these athletes. But at the time, back then, they wanted you to think more on the realistic side of what was going on. And I got a call on Monday from the WCW, and they said, what are you having him do this thing for? He goes, he's with us. I said, well, his contract allows him to do whatever. I have three events. He'll complete the three events. He, can't, he couldn't continue anyway at the pace that the UFC went. And the WCW, he loved so much, and they were obviously paying astronomical amounts of money. It was an obvious answer to stay with WCW. So at that time, then I went to the UFC, and I said, okay, you need a buffer in the octagon. I have the media contacts. I believe this is gonna be the biggest thing happening in sports. I wanna be your octagon announcer and grow with you, but I will do everything I can that, I'm, that I have the ability to do in the media and my contacts and everything else to help you get this sport bigger and better. I'll help you brand it, because that's what I love to do. I recognize brands when they're gonna be strong, and I thought the UFC was gonna be the biggest thing ever. It kind of fell on deaf ears. 
Uh, about six months later, I had a fighter that I managed in Dubai, Puerto Rico in 1996 named Scott the Pitbull Ferrazzo. I did not want to be a fight manager. I put him in the event so I could go down there and convince him to let me announce the prelims, which they did. I announced three preliminary fights. I look at it now and I'm kind of like this when I watch it. But at the same time, I asked him, I said, I want to be your announcer. Well, they didn't hire me. Another six months went by. They asked me to announce UFC 10 because the announcer they had couldn't announce it. I went in and announced the entire event. I said, let me have the job. They didn't hire me. They hired somebody else. Another six or more months go by, and they called me up, and they said, listen, do you want to co-star on the TV show Friends, which was the biggest thing happening at the time, and it was in a second series? I said, of course, I'd love to. So they said, well, Warner Brothers is going to somebody, send somebody down for audio and videotape, and they'll let you know if you have the job. They came down, they picked it up, they called me that night, they said, be on the set tomorrow morning at 6 in the morning, rehearse all day, film on Wednesday, you're going to co-star as yourself on Friends. All right, now I thought, here, this is my shot. I met with the owner on the, sta on the uh, set for lunch, and I said, listen, Robert, I feel like someone being waiting to be asked to go to the prom, and nobody's asking me to go to the prom. I'm going to ask you one more time. I need to become the Octagon announcer. I will help you build the sport, build this brand. I'll do everything I can, but I want to grow with you as the announcer. I'm a big poker player. That was the best poker hand I ever played in my life. He said yes, and from that point on, I announced every event in the UFC until it became too many, and now I have an uh, excellent backup announcer that does six or seven shows a year while I announce all the other ones, and it has grown. It's grown from spectacle to mainstream sport. I've been on this UFC rocket ship now for, it'll be 30, excuse me, 29 years come February, and it's an amazing first class seat that I love to have, and I want to thank everybody at the UFC, especially Dana White. When Dana White took over the UFC in 1999 with the Vertita brothers, I, we were about to go out of business. I knew we would make it. And with his tenacity, his amazing guidance, and everything he does today, we are where we are. And it's just an amazing experience. And out of this, I've been able to appear for many other sports. I've opened up for the Raiders, basketball, uh, hockey, baseball, beer pong, you name it. I've done so many different things. And I travel the world doing all these events. Uh, tonight, I'm going to make a very special appearance for the Olympia. I'll be at the F1 in a couple of weeks. And I love what I do, and I have so many people to thank for everything I do. But most of all, I want to thank my family and my loved ones. Because without the support factor of my family and my loved ones, I would not be where I am today. I have an amazing business partner and close friend named Kristen. She, without her and everything we do in my business when I travel the world, without her running everything back at the, at the home ship, um, we're just an amazing team that runs this entire business together, as I still also manage the career of my brother, Michael Buffer. But I'm also very lucky to have amazing parents. I've lost both my parents. I lost my beautiful mama last year, right before Christmas. I would call her before and after every UFC, and I still do in my heart because I know she's my guardian angel looking down on me. And my brother, Brian, without their support, and Brian, whom I grew up with my entire life, they're my biggest fans and their love and support and motivation have been a driving force for me my entire career. So I just want to make sure without, if I've missed anybody, there are so many people to thank. I'm blessed to do what I do. Every night I walk out in the octagon, I consider it my first day. I walk out to prove to myself, to prove to you, to prove to the fighters, to prove to the fans, Dana White, the powers that be, that I deserve this job. I wake up every morning with UFC on my chest, being very proud of the whole thing, and I plan on going on for many, many years to come, and it's very important to me. So with that being said, there's only one thing left to say. This is the moment we've all been waiting for. It's time! Made it, Mom! Top of the world! Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. Thank you. Hey, what can I say? I'm an announcer. I always have to have a card around, right? <laughs> Our next inductee, a personal hero of mine, Jim Pluckett, American football player and legend, quarterback, played in the National Football League for 16 seasons. He achieved his greatest success during his final eight seasons with the Raiders franchise, whom he led to two Super Bowl wins. He also played for the New England Patriots and the San Francisco 49ers. His numerous awards include two Super Bowl championships, Super Bowl MVP, NFL Comeback Player of the Year, and the prestigious Heisman Trophy. He is our fifth Heisman Trophy inductee into the International Sports Hall of Fame. 
His achievements have also earned him a place in the California Sports Hall of Fame, and he was inducted into the College Football Hall of Fame in 1990. He set so many records in college, too many to mention, but his coach at the time said, this is the best college football player I've ever seen. Aside from the Heisman, he captured the Maxwell Award for the nation's best player and was named Player of the Year by United Press International, the Sporting News, and Sport Magazine. He became the second multiple recipient of the W.J. Voigt Trophy, and, was, and that's awarded each year to the most outstanding, outstanding football player. He's a remarkable athlete, and next year, hopefully, he will be inducted into the NFL Hall of Fame, which he definitely deserves. And he is one of the only Latino athletes to be named Super Bowl MVP. Let's give it up for Jim Plunkett, NFL Superstar. It's certainly a pleasure to be here among all these terrific athletes and what they've accomplished. Uh, yeah, I grew up, you know, not knowing what I wanted to do. I, my, both my parents were blind, my mother totally, my father legally, uh, but the, yet they raised three children. And, uh, and they, we were on welfare growing up. And I wanted to make a better life for myself, and I had to find a way to do that. So I worked hard, been working ever since I was, you know, eight years old, picking fruit, doing whatever I had to do. Uh, to help our family and uh, you know that work ethic stuck with me all my life and all of a sudden I, I fell in love with sports and uh, initially I thought I was going to be a, a professional baseball player but then I, I, I fell in love with football and and worked very hard at it uh, at first I was a lineman didn't want to be there very long <laughs> a little tough down there in the trenches uh, so you know I changed positions I started throwing the court uh, the football you know, and as my coaches used to say, throw 100 passes a day just to, to warm up. And uh, I worked very hard at my, at my position. And, uh, you know, things fell into place. Uh, got successful in high school, successful at college. Uh, won the Heisman Trophy in college. And then I was drafted by New England in Boston. Uh, was there for five years. It didn't work out. Went to San Francisco for two but found a home, and they got, I got cut, which is, you know, I thought I was going to quit sports. I was quit football at that time. Uh, uh, I was depressed. I was, you know, really out of the game I loved. And a couple of days later, the Raiders gave me a call, literally turned my career around. And, you know, I'm thankful to Mr. Davis, uh, who owned the Raiders at the time, and Tom Flores, who's the coach, and kind of got back into the profession I loved. And, uh, you know, saying that, I was fortunate to be surrounded by a lot of other great players who could help me do what I do best, and that's throw the football. And we were very fortunate to have won uh, two Super Bowls in that time. And it was a struggle. I, you know, I, I wanted to quit. I didn't want to go on in that sport anymore. But Mr. Davis said, you know, we'll help you be a better player. And he, and he did. And I worked hard at it. Uh, I didn't start when I got there. They had a, uh, another really fine quarterback in Kenny Stabler, so it took a while. And I, you know, I thought I was going to, you know, just just shove it all away and, and do something else. But as I said, I, I'm a hard worker. I worked hard, got back at the starting position, and, and was very fortunate to, to have won two Super Bowls. And I, I want to thank the players that helped me. I want to thank my wife, who's here right now, for supporting me in those down times. It was a very, very difficult time for me because uh, I'd always been successful until I, I got in the NFL initially. And, uh, and I'm very thankful that things turned out the way they did. And I, and I want to thank the uh, uh, International Sports Hall of Fame for, for having me here and being a part of this wonderful celebration. Thank you. You know, over the years, we've had 50 Olympi Olympia titleists, male and female, inducted. 
And the next, in, next inductee is somebody who I always had a great, uh, great time hanging out backstage with before we go and beat everybody's ass. Phil Heath, IFBB Pro League professional bodybuilders, known as The Gift. And you know, he had a movie come out about his journey in life, and it really is truly remarkable what Phil has been able to do, the things he has overcome, the challenges he's overcome, to be the best in the world. He entered bodybuilding in 2002. In 2005, he won the overall title at the MPC USA Championship. He is a seven-time Mr. Olympia winner, winning every year from 211 to 217, defending that title consecutively six more times. He's tied with Arnold Schwarzenegger for seven-time Mr. Olympia wins. In terms of the International Sports Hall of Fame, he joined the other inductees, Ronnie Coleman, Lee Haney, Corey Everson, and Linda Murray. So we've got some amazing people, who, and Jay Cutler, who have been inducted into our International Sports Hall of Fame. And Phil also is very involved in charity work. He sponsored something called Make It Fit, a foundation for autism awareness. And in addition, he visits many of the hospitals in Colorado, along with a 10-year involvement with the USO, traveling to missions to places all around the world, from the Middle East to different places in order to bring his inspiration and energy to our troops overseas. Let's give it up for Mr. Olympia, seven time, Phil Heath. You know, when you go out for something that you never had before, you realize that you have to put yourself in a place that can sometimes be dark. But to get through it, you have to seek light. For me, growing up in Seattle, Washington, um, I was asked in high school, playing at Rainier Beach High School, we were a top team in the state. I had a great teammate by the name of Jamal Crawford. He played 19 seasons in the NBA. Uh, he was six man, NBA six man, three times. And I remember someone from the Seattle Times was like, oh, you're going to the University of Denver on a full right scholarship. Um, any plans on going pro? It's an NBA. Now I'm a realist. I don't have Brian Shaw's height. I'm very height challenged for the sport of basketball. And I said, I don't know if I'll be ever pro in basketball but I'll be pro at something. And I felt like that was a godsend because, um, you know, I went to the University of Denver, had high hopes to obviously doing, you know, big and better things. I majored in business and also in IT. But the college career just didn't pan out. Um, Coach Marty Fletcher, I actually have to thank him for not playing me much. <laughs> It drove my disappointment through the roof. Uh, I was very depressed, um, but I hung in there and I got to see the alchemy of what life really is and that is to be able to see the opportunities that are in front of you, which is a great solid education and to meet some great teammates that you can create lifelong friendships. Needless to say, as I was in my fifth year of education, um, I happened to be sitting next to a gentleman um, who was really stinking up the classroom with his rice, tilapia, and excuse my language, fucking broccoli and asparagus. It was just, anybody's ever been around a bodybuilder, those, those type of meals are just disgusting, right? And he had these bodybuilders on his laptop screen. Eight-time Mr. Olympia, Ronnie Coleman, he had Flex Wheeler on there, Kevin Lavroni, and a couple others. Now on my laptop screen, I had a beautiful model by the name of Brooke Burke, pretty much butt naked. I was like, man, this is like, this is compare and contrast. I go, what's that all about, Oscar? And he was like, if you wanna learn more about it, meet me in the student gym. Now, mind you, being a division one athlete, you have your own gym facility, you're kind of segregated amongst the other students. So uh, being that I had already 
played four years of college ball. I was just doing my fifth year of education. I decided to not go train in that facility, go with him to a new facility, and I found all of these bodybuilders. And what was really awesome was to see the camaraderie of it. Um, I was encouraged to go to a competition, and there was a bodybuilder by the name of Claude Gruel that was actually the Masters Olympia champion who I took a photo with. And keep in mind, you know, being a basketball guy, you usually wear long shorts, tank top, some Jordan sneakers, kind of like what Brian Shaw has on. And uh, my friend was like, Phil, like, you're supposed to hit a bicep pose with uh, this pro. So uh, I hit a bicep shot, and these other fans walk by, and they go, holy shit, this guy's got big-ass big arms like Claude. And so Claude Gruel, like, kind of looks at me, and he goes to my friend, and he goes, you does he bodybuild? He's like, nah, man, he plays hoop. <laughs> he plays basketball. And uh, Claude Gruel said, uh, you should really consider this. And I was like, nah, I'm never going to do that. Like, why would I go expose myself like this? But uh, needless to say, I wanted a new challenge. And I knew that basketball had to, you know, go in the background. Um, on October 8th, 2002, I actually... Um, I'm really dating myself at the moment because we have these things called iPhones that have great megapixels and resolution. I had a 1.8 megapixel camera that I set on the mantle and I waited for all of my collegiate teammates to vacate to go to practice and I took my first selfie. <laughs> and I call it like JC Penney catalog poses. <laughs> so I take this picture and I said, this is the day that I become a bodybuilder, and I don't give a damn what happens, but I know I'm gonna be better than this guy in this photo. And I kept taking those pictures every couple weeks, trying to assess my progress and just being a student of myself. Um, and in really enjoying the process of just transforming my body into something that I could appreciate. And I knew that unlike a, a team sport, where I was more worried about um, making them look good or trying to hold them accountable or hoping that a coach would actually put me in the game. This was a sport that I get to put myself in the game all the time, holding myself accountable, creating new standards. On, a, on April 4th, pretty much six months later after that, April 4th of 2003, I actually did the NPC in Northern Colorado where I was able to meet Jay Cutler for the first time. And he was a guest poser at that show. And um, I was scared out of my mind because this guy was just so massive. And my friend was like, go take a picture with Jay. And I was like, okay. So I, I'm trying to think of something cool to say or masculine or whatever. And I'm like, what do you weigh? And he was like, 290. And I'm like, well, shit, I'm 190. <laughs> and, um, you know, it was a really cool moment. But what was interesting is that I was so freaking terrified to go on that bodybuilding stage because unlike any other sport, um, there takes a level of vulnerability, hard work, but the vulnerability of being pretty much adjudicated with no clothes on that I just didn't understand. And, you know, it's easy to pose in your own mirror. And we know plenty of people on social media love to take those bathroom selfies. But in this sport, there is no mirror. It's, and you really can't, um, <laughs> do anything but hope and pray that you put in the work and to present your best and be fully confident in who you are and have that emotional intelligence to create your own piece of art. So fortunately for me, I was able to not only compete but to win my first show. Although I was scared, I was very happy. I was very elated over the opportunity to finally get a good win for myself. Um, I was able to then take that further and went into junior nationals and flying out to California and meeting Joe Weider. And uh, I just didn't realize, holy smokes, man, I can travel. I can be paid to work out. Huh, this is interesting. And uh, it was upon that time I remember Jay said, you know, these guys are going to try to sign you. And I was like, dude, you're out of your mind. Like, there's no freaking way. Like, someone would pay a person. And he was like, well, dude, like, I get paid for that same job. What are you talking about? So, you know, I, I put my best foot forward, did those photo shoots at the Junior Nationals. I actually won that show um, and then went uh, in 2005, went in the Mr. USA overall title. Uh, shortly thereafter that, you know, I, I won my first two pro shows, got a lot of good publicity and whatnot, and was able to travel the world. 
you know, in bodybuilding, there's a, it, it, bodybuilding may not be as big in America, but overseas is tremendously, tremendously positive and popular in over 190 countries. Uh, we currently, I believe we have uh, just over 600 different bodybuilding shows internationally. Um, but I, I want to talk to everyone about, you know, limiting beliefs in a fixed mindset and how you have to have a growth mindset. You know, in 2008, I did my very first Mr. Olympia, and that was a tough time for me because although it was my first time and I was very scared, I was very happy, but I was very sad because my friend Jay Cutler lost. And I got to see like how things could be taken away. And I also got to see a new person win where I was like, well, maybe I can beat him if that's the case. And I remember sitting in a car with Jay for about four hours and Jay was telling me about how he wanted to retire, how he just was like, oh, well, I guess they don't want this. I'll go be the entrepreneur that I am, and I'm just going to continue to just do that stuff. And I was like, there's no way in hell you're going to do that, but keep talking. And, um, you know, it, it sat with me for a minute because I just knew, I was like, he's going to come back. And in 2009, he did, and he kicked the shit out of all of us. And that allowed me to realize that um, history can be made. And, you know, you could have that fixed mindset of saying, like, I'm not going to do this, I'm going to do something else, and then he changes his mind and decides to put a, put a positive spin on it and then created a new legacy, in my opinion. But it also gave me inspiration. So in 2010, I went ahead and did the Olympia, and I lost to Jay. Uh, but it was very interesting because, you know, when you train for something, and we've all really been there, where we say we want something and we'll actually declare it, we'll say it online, we'll write all the cool little captions on social media, but when you're up there with no clothes on and Bob Chicarillo is taking his sweet ass time to say who's the next Mr. Olympia champion, your heart is freaking racing. And doubt seems to sink in. You realize that you're not quite ready for that weight of what's a champion, you know, legacy gonna be. I saw how Ronnie Coleman was treated. I saw how Jay Cutler was treated. I knew that the, the weight of the crown was very, very heavy. And I remember just being okay with being called second. And shortly thereafter, I was able to watch the, uh, I was a student of myself as well, so I decided to watch the video over and over and over again. And I started getting pissed off because I realized I'm actually, being a fake. I'm actually saying that I want something, but I'm not doing something internally that's going to provide me what I truly deserve. So from that, uh, that point on, and I remember I had a conversation with Jay, and he said, we're friends, but you have to be focused on being Mr. Olympia. So I decided from that day forward, it, it has nothing to do with beating Jay Cutler. It had all to do with beating myself, doing the self-work, creating the un paralleled belief that I can go ahead and achieve a moment of history for myself and for everyone that decided to put effort into me. And um, in 2011, I won that damn title. And I realized right then and there that every person that said I could, and even the ones that said I couldn't, it all mattered. It was all good. And I made it great. And from that point on, I knew that my name would be ingrained in history as one of the best bodybuilders of all time. I just never looked back from that. And I thank God for not making me a basketball player. I thank God for the, pa for the fact that, he, you know, I even had an ex-girlfriend from college that said, hey, what are you going to do with your life? And I said, I want to be in one of those fitness magazines. And she said, you don't have the look for that. So. When I got my first cover of Flex Magazine, I sent the box to her mom's house. When I got the second title, I remember being asked, how many do you want to go for? And I said, I want to go for 10. And I remember that during that time, a lot of people were, quite honestly, just upset that I would say something that big, because at the time, there was only eight Mr. Olympia titles. Um, Lee Haney won eight, and Ronnie Coleman won eight. And I say, why not 10? And I learned right away that there's a lot of people that will throw shade on your dream. They'll tell you that you can't. And I said to myself, 
if I'm talking to the four-year-old Phil here, and he was asked, what do you want to be when you grow up? And if he said, I want to be a doctor, a lawyer, a 10-time Mr. Olympia, a Super Bowl winning quarterback, that person would say, go for it. So that's who I spoke to. And with every rep, every set, I almost made it happen. And I got seven, tying with the great Arnold Schwarzenegger. I'm here because of the fact that I had mental fortitude but I'm also here because I never gave up on myself. And I really do hope that each and every one of you, no matter what traumas you may have, whether it be big or very small, that you remind yourself that you can always be the light. You just have to tell yourself that you deserve it and you have to give yourself permission to be great, especially when the chips are down. Thank you, Dr. Bob, for this amazing opportunity. And along with Hack, this class is incredible. I'm very honored, and um, I'm smiling right now because I just heard Bruce Buffer speak, and I remember um, seeing Ronnie Coleman be announced by you, and I remember thinking, and I was in the stands, and um, I said, I hope to God that I can have that moment where I can be on the Olympia stage as a champion. It's just so interesting how our lives can be intertwined. And I really do hope that with the pictures that we all get to share, that we continue to share them. And who knows where we may meet up again, but I just want to tell each and every one of you that I respect the hell out of all of your hard work and dedication to your craft, to your art, and also to your fans. Thank you for that. And for everyone here, thank you for coming. Thank you for pouring your love and support to all of us. And for everyone watching, continue to be your best version of self, especially when no one is watching. God bless you all. Thank you. Uh, before we take the class picture, know that we share because of the way that this has been structured. We share everything with everyone. All the photos, the videos are posted. You guys can feel free to share them with whatever you want. Again, this is totally non-commercial. We want you to get the word out so that we can all inspire that next generation of kids coming up. That's what these guys have done and ladies have done during their lives, and we want you to continue, as well as our other past inductees in the audience, continue to inspire that next generation to make that little kid at home watching these people go, you know what, I want to be like them. And that's the reason for this award ceremony. And I want to thank everybody coming. We're going to be taking some, we're going to take our, class, our standard class picture next, and then we're going to hang around for a while so you can get some photos and you actually get to meet these amazing, amazing records.